thanks for positive pieces, uh, introduction uh, again. And also thanks to the praise team to lead us to a very uh, good time of uh, him singing to praise our Lord. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And life is worth living. This is the core message of what we are going to see in Acts from mission to calling. We as, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are not just to obey commandments, but we also do the mission of the God. And even more importantly today, now I want to tell you, is to respond to the calling of the Lord. But first of all, how would you differentiate commandments, missions, and calling? Commandments refers to the rules and regulations God requires us to follow. Examples include love your Lord, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is from Mark uh, 12 to 30. Or love your labor as yourself. This is the immediate next verse, uh, verse 31. Not giving up meeting together in Hebrews chapter 10 to 25. So bear in mind, do join the prayer meeting and fellowship this coming Wednesday. Huh? You shall not give false testimony. Uh, Exodus uh, 20 to 6, 2016. You shall not commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother giving of the tenth. We have no choice but just to follow the commandments what God instructs. That's commandments. But on top of commandments, we also have to do the mission of the Lord. Missions refers to the life directions God wants us to go for. Examples include sharing the gospels, gospel to your neighbors, or cross-cultural mission, church planting, caring our needy in our society, witnessing Christ in all areas of our life. All that is about making disciples of Jesus Christ of all nations, all ethnic groups within our society or beyond. Unlike commandments, we are given a relatively more freedom of choice of what areas of God's mission we are to participate in. But now calling. Calling refers to the unique walk of God, unique walk with God. He called us to explore. So we are to test and approve what God's will is in just like Roman uh, 12 verse 2. It means to us individually and specifically. In doing that, we would experience the fuller meaning of our life that God intended us to be. Somehow, calling may be the most abstract concepts amongst the three. Let me explain with more examples. God called Moses to be the leader of the Israelites of his time, that he would lead the people out of Egypt's slavery. Uh, uh, in our uh, in second hymn, we also mentioned about Egypt. He, his calling is so unique that even his elder brother, Aaron, does not have, have, have a share. Well, Aaron got his own calling. That is to speak on Moses' behalf. As such, Moses cannot be Aaron, but at the same time, Aaron cannot be Moses. Each have his own walk with God. In Jesus' time, he taught us the same principle. Jesus told Apostle Peter he will lose his freedom and hinted he will be mortared. When Peter first heard that, he was not so happy and then asked Jesus, how about Apostle John's future would be? Jesus responded, if I want him to retain a life until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. From this, we are crystal clear that in following Jesus, we have to walk out a unique way of life. But allow me to speak the truth out of love. Most of the Christians I come across do not aware they have such responsibility. 
The reasons are threefold. First, negligence. We are not aware we have such responsibility. But now, after this sermon, I hope we should not be in such state. Second, misconception. We understand that only we misunderstand that only certain people are called. God only calls a few people amongst the whole congregation for clergymen. However, in reality, God does not split us. God does not split his ruling to his creation in such holy and secular division. Third, confusion. We have mixed up mission with calling. Quite some Christians confuse that a certain way of doing the Great Commission equivalent to responding to the call of God. Such confusion makes them allow no room to do the Great Commission in a more flexible way. We may be afraid of accepting the fact that God calls each and every one of us in an individual manner for the diversity would be uncontrollable. However, the Bible, such as Ephesians chapter 4 and, the first Corin and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, teaches us that God will be in charge of such diversity. As the body of Christ, such diversity between body parts is needed in order that we are really unified. So let us now study Acts 26, 12 to 33 that we may learn how we can test and approve God's calling together. Let us first read verses 12 to uh, 15a again. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, So, so, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the gods. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? Verse 13 tells us there is a King Agrippa. Apostle Paul now is speaking to him for defense in the court. What happened? Why Paul is in such condition, in such a situation? A few years ago, Paul took a sum of money as giving from the church in Antioch to the church in Jerusalem. When he was in Jerusalem, he was being attacked by the Jewish people and later on, he was even being falsely accused as a troublemaker stirring up riots against the Jews all over the world, as mentioned in Acts 24, verse 5. As such, he was being retained and thus undergo a long process of litigation for years. During that period of time, he was being moved from the prison in Jerusalem to the prison in Caesarea, and he stayed there for at least two years. After these two years, he meets with this King Agrippa in the court. Who is this King Agrippa? His grandfather, Herod the Grey, actually was the one who wanted to kill baby Jesus. And his dad, Herod Agrippa I, who killed Apostle James mentioned in Acts 12. So by tracing his genealogy, we clearly see this King Agrippa Second is anti-Christian. Okay. My dear brothers, sisters, and friends, if you were Paul, you know how cruel this King of Crippa Second can be. Would you still say such things as we have just read? Would you still consider useful in sharing your testimony of calling with this king? Would you expect King Agrippa would treat you good? I'm afraid not. But then, why Paul still shared his testimony of calling in the court? What's the point? My personal point of view is that Paul just wants to grab this chance to make his testimony of calling go public. 
to glorify God. It's not for his safety, even if this would risk his life to the point of death. How come Paul would have such deep conviction in his calling? From verses 12 to 13, we can see that such conviction started when he repented. Such a moment of time crystallizes all he experienced in the past as a meaningful whole that also made him understood where he should go in future. I once heard people say, if we don't know where we come from, we won't be able to know where we should go. Let me call myself as an example, how I received the calling from the Lord. In 2004, I went to United States with my, life, with, with my wife, for he had to go to UC Berkeley for six months of training for public policy offered by the Hong Kong government. In doing that, I have to quit my full-time job in Hong Kong for I was too tired then. I took this six months uh, originally as a break, a time of rest and reflect on where I should go for in future. But then, the pastor of my mother church at that time asked me, Stephen, why don't you spend that period of time for taking some courses in the seminaries there? Well, I never took any courses in Hong Kong, in the seminaries in Hong Kong, due to my faith background from disciple-making ministry. I believe that studying the Bible should go, should go to our very first hand OIA, you know, and thus it seemingly studying theology is not necessary. But you know, how can I receive, how can I refuse him? I would be absolutely free during that six months. So I did finally took some courses in the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary and uh, Christian Witness Theological Seminary. When I started this learning process, my appetite of studying theology was open. I therefore decided to apply for MDF that I can continue my study when I returned to Hong Kong in September 2004. But in doing that, I need to submit my testimony of calling. What should I write in order to convince others to enroll me? On one Sunday day in San Francisco, I found a cozy sitting in a Starbucks coffee nearby. From 9 to 5, I had a long time of solitude with the Lord. I examined my past to count the convictions God put into my heart. I jotted down three major points. First, disciple making. I was deeply transformed by a personal disciple maker relationship with me during the first couple of years after I come to know Christ. I was deeply convinced that that's the key to spiritual growth in both personal and congregational dimensions. Second, serving the Lord through serving the global Chinese. As I mentioned, I study in a seminary called Christian Witness Theological Seminary. It's a small seminary in San Francisco, but within that small seminary, it was a place where the whole world of Chinese from all over the world condensed within a small class of 20 classmates. We were from all parts of the world, and we are from all walks of lives from our 20s to 60s. In fact, one of my classmates were a research fellow in Wuhan who was also a very good Christian leader in the Free Self Church there. Regrettably, he lost his life in COVID-19 in January last year. From this, I saw that if we are to make these Chinese all over the world disciples of Jesus Christ, it would be one step closer in reaching the whole world. Third, integrating architectural studies with theological training for holistic life services. In my early days of Christian journey, I came across some quite faithful brothers and sisters 
who were professionals in building industry. They enjoy a very good salary income in Hong Kong. They can choose to live a comfortable life. However, they step out from their comfort zone for more than a decade. On each and every weekend, they come to a university in Guangzhou to share their professional knowledge with the students studying architecture and city planning there. As time goes by, they gain strong trusting relationship with the school and the students get to know what it means by professional in moral and ethical terms. It's a great change to the society and individual lives. As I reviewed my life in Starbucks coffee, I finished writing my testimony. It was a testimony of my life's conviction, but it did not mention I wanted to be a pastor. Thanks for God's leading, I was still admitted to the seminary as MD student. In 2005 to 2007, I was sent by my seminary to Yanfu Church, the place here I am now, as an intern. But I was still not sure if it's God's leading me to serve here in Yanfu. I therefore applied for some other posts soon after graduation. However, just a few weeks later, in July 2007, I was invited to come back to Yanfu again for there was a chance to build a Bible theme park in mainland China. How come there would be a church there to initiate such risky kind of project? And even more special is that it happened right at the time I graduate. Such chance perfectly respond to what I wrote by faith three years ago in the opposite side of the globe. With such clear God's guidance, I was called to serve in Yan Folk. Although the Bible theme park project soon ceased. But the three key points I convinced in my life, I just share with you, still perfectly effectively determined my way of service in Yan Folk till now. Our positive response to God's call is to live your life to the fuller extent for God's purpose is the best way to experience God's amazing grace and love. My dear brothers and sisters and friends, do you see how much God loves me in this witness? Let me tell you, God does not just love me in such immense extent. God loves you as the same way He loves me. Have you decided to respond to God's call that you can experience God's love as the way I shared? Let us continue to read verses 15b to 18. This to record Jesus' response to Paul. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to night and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. How Paul was able to understand what he should do and be in God's will at the present time. In, verse, in verses 15 to 18, he quoted, there was an utterance Jesus directly given to him, right? We just read that. But when we read this passage in conjunction in Acts 9, we will see that was not a mere subjective experience. It was coupled with many other people witnessing what Paul was experiencing at the time, at the time, and later on, such subjective experience was even more verified with 
a man called Ananias, whom was also sent by the Lord. So as such, we can see that our own subjective experience, our brothers and sisters, confirmation and a third-person verification are the three indispensable ways to clarify God's call. In the fellowship I'm serving, there's a brother in the Lord. We call him Rocky. He had, he had been an interior designer for many years before he came to know Christ. I know him ever since I was uh, a seminary in intern since 2005. In around 2020, Rocky started participating in the visitations organized by our church so so concerned department to some households around our church in some shape, Paul and, and around. When he saw the deprived situation of those people living there, broken windows, you know, leaking taps and toilets and rest and cockroaches all around, he asked himself, Lord, what do you want me to do for you given me to see? We all know that his passion and burden during the whole process, we all don't know what to do next. That's the process of confirmation. Until the day, until one day in December 2015, some of our church deacons with finance and accounting background incidentally proposed a campaign called Love Guided Actions uh, in, in Cantonese, Sam Dou Hang. That is to invite our brothers and sisters in our church to exercise their own unique, unique spiritual gifts. They can use their unique skill set to propose to the church certain projects to serve each other or to serve our community. Today, after I share this campaign in my fellowship, I got a proposal immediately one day after that from Rocky to raise up a team of volunteers in our church to help the needy people by providing some simple household repairs and maintenance works. To be frank, <laughs> he is not the kind of person who can produce quality documents that can meet our church administration standard for approval. But I knew him well for many years, you know, that I have witnessed God did push such godly burden, burden into his heart. Many other brothers and sisters witnessed that as well. So I therefore offer lots of helps in this regard to make his proposal approved. And we just such, and we trust such approval procedure play a third person verification role, as I mentioned. However, this is not the end of the story. Two years later, even the proposal was approved by the church and even paid money to support this service. It doesn't mean automatically we have jobs to do. It took us these two years of perseverance and waiting. During that time, we secure a third party insurance for works we are going to carry out. It's not a simple thing we can buy from the market. And more importantly, we waited for God's provision, good partners from the society that we can channel, that they can channel us enough numbers of little households that can make this ministry really running. All these God-driven verification play a crucial, important role that make us ensure we are walking within God's will. Allow me to speak the truth with love. If someone tells you he or she don't need others to confirm God's call on his life and don't need a third person verification, it would be a materialistic deviation from Bible's teaching. So let us be humble and transparent in seeking God's will and calling together. We need others to walk alongside with us. Now, we finally read the last five verses, 19 
to 23. So then, King Agrippa and was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, Domestic, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this every day. So I stand here and testify in small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to raise from the dead, would bring the message to, of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. As I said earlier, Apostle Paul here does not seek to win the litigation, but just wanted to share his te testimony of how he was called by Jesus Christ. As such, he would share the gospel of Jesus Christ in a most perfect way. Whether he would win or lose in the litigation, whether he would live or die at the end, it doesn't matter to Paul anymore. That's what he meant by he was not disobedient to the vision from heaven in verse 19. In 2 Corinthians, Chapter 11, 24 to 29. Apostle Paul also mentioned how much sufferings he received in the past. From bodily sufferings to the depression and stress from inside out, from potential and true danger to life threats, from misunderstandings to intentional and planned executions, accusations. However, Paul did not boasts about his sufferings. On the contrary, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 to 13, 30, he said, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my witnesses. You see how humble Paul is, and this also sheds us light to understand what faithfulness really means. Apart from Rocky, there's another member in my fellowship, Florence, also submitted a proposal to the church for the Love Guided Actions, uh, Sam Dohan campaign. She is a registered nurse for over four decades, very well experienced, but he did not satisfy with just using her profession for earning money, earning a living for, for, for herself and her family. Starting from late 1990s, she had mobilized my fellowship to serve the elderly homes nearby our church. When I come to serve in this fellowship, in 2009, Florence had already had doing this service for more than 10 years. In, 19, in early uh, 2010s, she even applied for early retirement so that he can spend more time for serving the elderly people as a volunteer. By the time, she was a ward manager in Caritas Hospital. Throughout the years, she had developed quite some down to earth and ready to use materials to serve the elderly people. If you are interested to use these materials for, for serving the elderly people together, please let me know. In recent years, she even tried to reach out to mainland China with the hope that all her experiences in serving the elderly can be a blessing to the souls up there, even if her knees are not so good in climbing up and down in the hilly rural areas in mainland China. In 2016, being inspired by Rocky, she also submitted a proposal to our church under the Love Guided Actions Samdohan campaign. But this time, she shifted the focus from operational level to the level of introspection of God's call through the services. By learning and participating how to serve the elderly people together, we examine our journey inward along. We do hope to nurture people's conviction in God's calling that he or she 
may continue to devote his or her whole whole life to serve for God's missional purpose without reservation, even to the time of sufferings and afflictions. Answering God's call would not guarantee you a comfortable life, other people's respect, or even a good thing. I'm sorry to say, please don't expect any good feeling or experience from that. But we can do guarantee we can give a good account of ourselves to God when the judgment day is to come. Now, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, do you know your calling from the Lord? Are you prepared to respond to that? Let us pray. Let us have a minute of silence to settle down what we have listened deeper in our souls and in our hearts. I'll give you a minute of silence. After that, we continue our prayer together. My dear brothers, sisters, and friends, do you want to plan for a certain regular time this year before the Lord to ask Him and seek His guidance to understand and explore God's call on you? If yes, let me pray for you. Also, are you willing to offer your whole life, all your knowledge, all your experience, all your skills and abilities for serving the Lord? If yes, let me pray for you. Also, do you want to share your fellow do you want to share with your fellow brothers and sisters to walk with you as alongsiders to explore what are the specific calls on you? Do you want that fellowship? If yes, let me pray for you. Finally, I want to call. Are you prepared to pay for the price in responding to God's call? Are you ready? But finally, I can guarantee you will be accountable to your Almighty Lord on the judgment day to come? If yes, let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we thanks for the salvation that gives us a brand new life. A renewed life from inside out for God's purpose, for doing your good work, for witnessing you and to glorify you. You are so wonderful that you have created each and every one of us so unique that we can reflect your glory in our own unique way. Father, open our eyes that we can see that, that we can follow that, we can work that out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.